what the health tech listeners. I'm your host this week, Ian Bulmer, Chief Partnerships Officer at Radar Healthcare. This is the podcast where we tackle some of the trending topics, ideas and best practice in health and social care. Today, we're joined by Mark Fuster, our Chief Product Officer, and he's going to help us deep dive into our CQC dashboards, a powerful tool created to support health and social care organisations in navigating compliance, governance and patient safety standards. We'll explore why they were developed, how our partners use them, and the measurable impact they've made. Let's unpack the story behind the dashboards and how they're helping organisations deliver safety and smarter care. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Hello. People need to write shorter introductions, I think. They're so hard to say. Yeah, I know, I know. But it's the kind of right thing. It's getting all the messages across of uh, what we need to talk about today. So, um We've got some formal questions as well, but I know you well, so I don't know how far we'll stick to these questions or how much we'll end up on a bigger conversation. But if it's okay with you, should we start with the questions? We can. Fab. So the first question is, uh, starting with the bigger picture, can you tell us why Radar Healthcare decided to create these CQC dashboards and what was the main gap that we were trying to address? I think the bigger picture for us is... Let's let's about specifically CQC. So if you just think of kind of an inspectorate in some way, shape, or form, so CQC obviously just being England and, and one of them, it was a way of trying to pull all the information that we're capturing within Radar into a single place. So if you think of what we're doing as a product, I mean, you obviously know this stuff, but you know we're underpinning people's policies, we're underp- underpinning people's processes, staff training, auditing, basically all of the elements that any inspectorate, to be fair, is interested in when they come in and inspect your service. So for us, the change in the CQC framework, if you like, which just so we can only change it again, but at the time, the change where they were saying, well, actually, what we're interested in is we're interested much more around actually the evidence that you can provide around the different statements and quality statements. And we wanted a way to say, well, actually, what's the best way of enabling our customers to quickly access that information? Because obviously, it's, it's stored in radar already. It could be, a, as I say, it could be a policy, it could be an audit, it could be a scheduled task, it could be any of the different elements of the product. And actually, the CQC framework, as was, and to be fair, as is, uh, it allows kind of quite a nice way of connecting that data together. So you might connect it around things like, you know, the, the old Chloe statements of the safe, the well led, for example. And so the dashboard was a way of saying, well, actually, for each service, here's what your current score looks like, and it could be mock or it could be real. And then if you want to surface, and here's the important bit, the evidence, so that might be your audit scores, it might be lessons learned, it might be observations, you can do that at a click of a button, in essence. So you're able to just go, right, show me everything to do with well-led. Um, I think that's probably one of the key things, isn't it? Because I know we've spent between us a lot of time trying to think how to describe how Radar can pull all this stuff together generally, because that's the whole beauty of the system. It's quality, it's safety, it's risk, it's compliance, it's everything in one place. And I know we've looked at things like Lego blocks or different kinds of diagrams to explain that, but probably the CQC work was a real example of all this information being in one system and being able to pull it into one place. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I use a Lego kind of analogy quite a bit because you think of it as the building blocks, the building blocks of what you're trying to underpin within an organization. So as I say, it could be, let's pick some really simple ones. It could be your policies, which are going to be stored in your documents. And then you've got the, well, is that in date or not? And the, the, the type of structure you'd expect from a document management system. But then once you connect that to our compliance system, you can now evidence actually are people trained or not. And so you're starting to create meaningful connections between two different areas of the product. So again, from an inspectorate point of view, CQC point of view, when somebody comes in and says, well, actually, show me that you've got a policy and that policy is in date. Great, you've got a tick because that's a policy module, that's the documents. But you've also now able to evidence, well, actually, here's the evidence that our staff have been trained on this and they've understood the policy. But then more importantly, when things go wrong, in inverted commas, our event and our process mimics exactly what our policy is saying. So you've kind of got that full circle there. And again, if you're setting the system up to link those to things like the Chloe statements, to say, well, actually, these type of events are to do with safe or well-led. Again, it's like a single click, right? Show me everything to do with this particular area of of our framework. In this this case, CQC, just be one of them. Yeah, and I think that's it. 
CQC evidence gathering, you're right, it could be any kind of commissioner, anyone that's interested in having that information in one place. And it's the evidence gathering that's the important bit and that full circle, which, like you say, is all there in radar. It's how do you expose that, which I suppose yeah, I is what you're saying is behind the design. Yeah, any frame, any, you think of what we do, almost like simplifying that value proposition of radar, we're underpinning basically what you're saying you're doing as an, org an organization. And that could be driven from kind of national, you know, legislation requirements, or it could be something super specific that you've got within your policy. But in effect, your build of radar would mimic what the CQC framework is expecting if you kind of in England or in Scotland at the care inspectorate. And the system's just able to configure to allow you to underpin, in essence, what you need to evidence to, to yourself internally, to be fair, but also to the inspectorate. Absolutely. Um, so moving to the next question, what has been, I'm going to rephrase this question, actually, I'm going off piece straight away. But the question is, what's been the overall response from the partners? But actually, um, I'm going to take it a step back. What was the original kind of involvement with our partners to build this? Because it's all well and good us having the ideas. But how did you go about that consultation piece? So, so it, was, it was kind of, it was slightly unusual in the sense that the, the customers were confused around what the new CQC framework actually meant. And there was a lot of, I don't understand how the scoring works. I'm not quite sure what this new evidence categories mean. I, I'm, I've not got clarity really on, because it was a lot of numbers, let's be fair. It was some, some numbers and it had been some more numbers and it had been some more numbers and then you ended up with a, a kind of an output. And I think people were super confused by that. So the, the kind of initial request was, Almost right, kind of right. People coming to us and do you, do you understand the new CQC framework? And like, thankfully, after kind of kind of research and due diligence, we we're in a place where the first thing that we did was almost just articulate back to the customers what this actually meant. So it was almost like a bit of, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the term, but that kind of thought leadership bit of where kind of like, look, here's what the CQC framework is looking like. Here's our interpretation of it. Because we were in this weird place where we we're having to interpret it because it wasn't super clear for, for customers. And I'd argue the, the, the rest of the market. And that evolved into, well, actually, there's an opportunity here to kind of say, well, look, this, this is, because the concept of what they're trying to do is spot on. You know, actually, we want to make sure that this is all around the evidence rather than just kind of someone coming in and, and, and just, you know, doing that inspection on the day. It's kind of the, the old way of doing it. And actually, it's more about the body of evidence you could put together to demonstrate this, which is unique to our ears because it's literally what radar is about. So actually, the building of the dashboard, that collaborative session with a number of different customers, to be fair, was just hearing from them, well, actually... What do you want? What, what, how do you want to be able to access the, this information? And again, it came down to, you know, their request. I'm oversimplifying it, but it was, actually, I just want to be able to kind of go, right, safe, click, and I've got some information there that's going to help me either evidence directly to the inspectorate or as allowing me to understand probably where we are and what our position looks like. So for us, whilst we're talking about the CQC dashboard, there's a whole load of other stuff that's kind of happening under the background where we're redoing our templates, we're redoing some of our other um, dashboards and things. So we're basically shipping the whole of the analytics and the product around, actually, how do I evidence this better? How do I understand the learnings in an easier way? And I can consume that via analytics at a single click. So again, it's like that interlinks, the bit you mentioned of all the modules are kind of interlinked together and then connecting those up so it's it's easy for people to be able to get the, get, get the data up. And then for the actual design exercise, the same way we always do it. So basically, we run workshops or sessions with customers where we're kind of talking about the problem. So in this case, we're all in a room talking about new CQC framework. And then it's the ideation that comes out of that those sessions, which we then prioritize to go, well, actually, here's something that we can solve, you know, super quick, or here's the thing that we think is going to add the most value. And then based on that, it ends up forming what the designs look like. And we build a prototype dashboard and prototype events you know, show those to customers, we get the feedback, and it's that kind of iterative loop, which which keeps continuing. So now that the CQC framework has not necessarily changed again, but they've gone back to the simpler scoring mechanism, that allows us to now go off and update the dashboards again to reflect what those changes look like. So for us, we don't see this as, A, here's our CQC dashboards, and when it changes, we're like, oh, well, no, if we did it for three years ago and it's no longer relevant, we're, we're about the evolution because we understand that actually the frameworks shouldn't just stay still because otherwise, you know, you, you just, you're not learning from those as a, as a national framework. And then for us, obviously we can just underpin 
anything really. Um, so we can spin up a new dashboard, we can spin up new event types like we did with the observations. And but it's all about that cycle of listening, kind of understanding what that customer or that market requirement is, putting a prototype for, for want of a better way of describing it together, seeing what people think of that, and then just keep iterating through that process. So it's, it's, it's constantly evolving. And it is that continuous improvement, isn't it? Because even if the requirements were evolving in the market, how we capture data, the tools that exist within the system, the ways in which people engage with the system, the likes of AI and things like that are always going to change. So you have to have that process regardless of what's going on externally. Yeah, absolutely. And and let's roll forward two years and it'll be Gen AI. You kind of go in, well, you know, look at my data within Radar and tell me what my CQC inspection is going to come back with and it'll come, well, actually, we you need to be worrying about your documents and you need to be worrying about this part and you need to worry about something else. And the system will be much better at enabling you to just surface this data. You know, the dashboard is just the first part of it, the, the roadmap, um, especially around kind of Gen AI and the sort of stuff that, that can help with. I think that stuff will be... Super interesting from from our side because obviously it's cool and it's good tech. But actually, from a usability point of view, just to be able to, you know, surface this information out of a system without you having a good dig for it. Yeah, so that you, it, it's interesting. I was looking at something um, at one of the NHS reports over the weekend from years ago, and um, into a specific trust. It was the Mark and Bay report actually, and one of the things that came out from that was that the data had been there, it just wasn't telling the story because it had been retrospective and it hadn't had that ability to actually pull it out and bring it to life. The key themes and the key trends. Yeah, and, and you think about the sort of information that any organization is capturing now, even within radar. So, you know, on a daily basis, you're capturing all of those events. You've got all that staff information coming through. All, all the kind of noise, for want of a better way of describing it, from a data point of view, is just going into a system. And if you just end up being that kind of data collector and you don't do the next bit, then all that means is somebody's got to interrogate that. And if they're not necessarily, if they're time poor and they've not got the time to do it or they're not necessarily kind of data savvy for a better way of describing it than exactly to your point the information is there but the red flags in that data and the things that you should be looking at are just not surfaced and then for us that's what we want to be we we want to be less about hey it's just a system to collect data and more around how do we surface meaningful things to it to everyone to be fair that that have relevance to that particular role so in this case uh, how do we surface something that's relevant to an inspection yeah yeah um okay so the next question is it's been over a year since we launched this how have the dashboards evolved based on feedback from your partners and any major updates so i think we're almost half answering that yeah has it been a year already because that is that's bonkers yeah i mean that's 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 yeah terrifying in one way um so the feedback's been really good i think the feedback has always kind of gills it ends up helping you think about what's the next thing to develop. So we can, as you said, we've sort of answered it. So actually people's feedback is around actually, how do I get this information out without actually having to kind of dig for it? Or even do things like, again, these are radar words, but things like put meta tags to the data. So you know that this has got to do with safe or, or, or well-led. We just need to be able to pull that out without anybody having to really configure a system or know what it is that they're looking for, if that kind of makes sense. So yeah, that, that kind of feedback is around what the shape of the roadmap is going to look like over the next kind of 12 to 24 months, which, as we've kind of talked about before, kind of that Gen AI, machine learning, more around analytics, that, 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 that's the driver for us. That's the focus. That's where the, the, the roadmap's heading. Yeah, and I suppose when you're talking about a kind of inspectorate like CQC or something that unifies everyone, it makes it easy to develop things because you've got a unified approach from the standing point of this is the requirements for that inspectorate. So that must be easier from a product design perspective. It, it is and it isn't because you've got the customers who still want to have that nuance internally. So whilst whilst the, the criteria in essence are the same, so if you're a CQC, for example, you know, the criteria you come and inspect everyone is, is always the same, you know, because obviously otherwise it'd be unfair. But actually the way different customers might configure their product and their business to evidence that or to demonstrate some of that isn't the same. You know, you could argue it probably would be a lot easier if it was the same, but there's different, there's in the, you know, the policies aren't the same, the processes aren't the same because they're different styles and types of organizations. But we can bring that back together in the analytics. So almost that way of kind of 
the system itself can be bespoke, could be what that customer needs it to be to underpin not just the you know the framework for the CQC, but what all the other things that that organization's doing because they'll have their own projects, their own strategy, their own programs internally that they're running that actually they need to configure a system to be able to manage and, and, and you know all the good things that radar does. But then in the analytics side, actually that's the point where you can start to go, well, all of this information feeds into these things from an inspectorate point of view or th- feeds into these things from the programs that you're working on. And that's the way where you translate it, for want of a better way of describing it, into something that's a bit more standardized, I guess, is probably the probably probably the right word. I mean, an ideal, and I think we're a long way away from this, but kind of an ideal vision, and, um, you know, possibly customers might not always be such a fan of this as my idea, but to, to allow people like the CQC to see some element of your organization all the time, rather than being kind of these periodic inspections, you've almost got kind of an always on where you're, you're feeding some specifics into them around you know policy management, maybe, or some of the events, things that are happening, rather than it being this kind of dipping in almost to kind of see what's going on and having that temperature test and then maybe doing that two years later, you know, you've almost got this constant um, analysis of what's happening. Yeah, it's and it's almost got joining up that journey where we're already on with our customers to be proactive rather than retrospective and actually take that into all the inspectorates and all the different kind of commissioning bodies out there to say, well, look, this is how you make sure we're all proactive and we're all stopping things before it happens, not just checking to see yeah, absolutely. And, and in a nice sense, another, as long as it's done in the right way, someone else, possibly more so for some of the smaller organizations, but somebody else helping support you in kind of understanding, hey, there's this risk in your organization. And I always kind of take near misses as a, as a good example. They're tomorrow's incidents, and that's the stuff you can get ahead of and, and actually make an impact on and stop them being, you know, a fall, pressure or whatever, whatever the actual incident is. So if you're able to, use that data in a way that allows you and possibly others to help intervene for of a better way of describing it to, to kind of have an impact there. I mean, surely that is the ideal solution. You've got people, you know, supporting your organisation to help make you safer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So have you got any examples of how partners are using these dashboards day to day? What kind of data are they finding most valuable from it? Have we got anything like that? I know there's loads of use cases, but anything you could think of to talk about today? Uh, I think we are picking a specific customer. The the way I've seen it work best is, and again, they kind of read our words a little bit, but where they're constructing their own dashboards to support that CQC framework. So they're almost using our dashboard as kind of that single starting point for want of a better way of describing it. And then they're thinking about, well, actually, what do we want to evidence against, you know, safe, well-led, et cetera. And they might be linking that into their audits dashboard or they might be linking that into their scheduled tasks dashboard. So they're almost constructing their hierarchy, their framework of how people are interacting with the data with that kind of CQC dashboard at the heart of it. Or they might be just taking the concept of what we're doing. And again, this is the beauty of radar and saying, well, actually, we're not necessarily going to use the specific CQC dashboard that Radar have built, but we're conceptually going to build something that's kind of the same to, again, help kind of shape what they're, what they're doing in terms of the structure that, the, that they're, they're accessing. Yeah, and are the use cases or examples where people would kind of run alongside the CQC elements, their own strategic initiatives or their own quality initiatives within their organisation to get that entire view, not just kind of in silos? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's when I was talking about kind of programs or strategy that, 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 that they're doing. Again, that it's, it's helping you underpin the same thing. So within Radar, you've got that ability to be able to almost stick a post-it note to things, but for a better way of describing it, to say, well, look, this is CQC, this is safe, this is to do with program X, strategy Y. And then that's the sort of information that, again, you can either just filter within the product itself. But probably the more the power comes from, again, in the analytics where you can start to join those things up and start to kind of, you know, cr- create an idea about what's going on from a strategic point of view. So it might be you're looking at your risks and you're seeing how those risks flow down into, again, policy management, event management, you know, all discourse, that type of thing. The next question is around impact and measurable outcomes, which I know is hard because um, 
it's a fledgling process that we know is changing slightly with the CQC at the minute. But um, have we got any examples or do we see any real measurable impact from this, even just this style of approach, I think, is probably the wider question. It's less about the CQC dashboards, but more this approach of being proactive with your information. I think just creating those obvious links between data in radar and the CQC. QC framework helps people understand, well, actually, I, I now know, if, I'm, if I've got an issue with SAFE, I know what I need to do because I've got action plans to do with that. I can see what my events look like. So you've kind of got that really super obvious correlation between those two things. I think, again, speaking about the roadmap, the bit that's, the bit that's not easy, as you say, is to actually kind of go, well, look, what's the direct correlation between us doing X on this particular day and the thing that we were trying to have an impact on? So again, I'll pick a super basic example because it's easy to explain we might be a care home we might have had a number of repeat falls for example we're going to put an action plan in place that in theory is going to mitigate that in some way shape or form and then the impact of that should in theory be with reducing falls and repeat falls we as kind of radar in terms of product roadmap that's the focus for us over the kind of next 12 months for the analytics is not just to use our own data but to start bringing in other sorts of data so we talk about things like benchmarking where we might be talking about, look, just comparing apples with apples. So you're comparing a care home with a care home, an A&E department with an A&E department. Um, so that within your own organization, you've got that element of benchmarking. But bringing in the scale, so bringing in things like um, the admission numbers, um, bringing in things like um, you know occupancy rates if you're a care home and bed, bed, bed numbers, using that to then determine where the risk lies. So again, you might have one single fall in the care home, but they've only got two beds, and you might have one fall in the care home, and they've got 100 beds. The risk is very different in those, those, those two instances. So to surface that data, to help you understand where to spend your time or what action plans you need to do, what things you need to put in place to mitigate those risks. But then the important bit is, once you've done that, what difference did it make? So again, I'm going to super oversimplify, but think of it as almost like, we're going to tell you what levers to pull, so almost like we're going to surface the information to you from a risk point of view. We're going to go, well, actually, we think if you push button X, it's going to have, this is the thing that's important because it's linked to these failed audits, it's linked to these fall events. And then once you've pushed that button, pull that lever, what impact did it have? So actually, did it make a difference? Did it do the thing that you expected it to do? And then as importantly, was that maintained? So I might have, might have put an action plan in place to mitigate falls, for example, and then for some reason, two months down the line, we're drifting back up to what we were previously. And it might be we need to do a different action, or it might be that the current action plan, a little bit like a risk control, it is no longer adequate for some reason. So again, again, simplifying it, what levers to, to pull? And then when you do pull those levers, what impact did it have? So that's, that's where we need to get better as a product. That's where we need to be driving the roadmap, just to make that stuff super easy for people. Yeah, because I think that um, you have to work sometimes to find that information out. I think it's there. And just like we kind of take that scenario of data being there, historically, job one is to be able to expose that in a meaningful way that points to the levers you should pull. And actually, we have got the impact within the system. It's being able to pull it out in an easy, meaningful way. So to your very earlier point, we don't just become a data collection tool. Yeah, that's it. And just surfacing the proper risks. You know, I think... If, if we can get better at kind of highlighting the things that you need to worry about rather than it just being, hey, you've had all of these events of this type, so here's a red flag. It's there's a severity associated with these events and you're an outlier for some reason because what you're seeing is not normal. You know, maybe you're under, you know, maybe you're under reporting, maybe actually based on the reporting, you, we think you've got an issue. And then that helps you prioritize what to focus on rather than it being, you know, death by a thousand action plans. You know, because you see, actually, well, we need to create an action for this. We need to create an action for this. We need to create an action for this, which is good. But actually, you then think, well, I've got thousands of actions, which are the ones that I need to be doing. So that that's that's where we'll come in. We'll go, look, hey, we think this is the thing that you need to be focusing on. Yeah, and these are the th and then sharing the impact and sharing those action plans with everyone else across organisation and across. Again, we're just talking about there product wise. I'm just talking almost technically within that organization but broadly you know the lessons learned the action plans the things that have had an impact the community that kind of ecosystem as a whole yeah the plan is to share that there as well because if you've implemented some amazing action planning you've, you know you reduce falls by 50 percent in your care home 100 percent we want that to be shared you know whether that's the way you're doing it the process that you're doing whatever your learnings are we need those across our entire customer base Ult ultimately 
and again, without kind of sounding too trite about it, we need to be having an impact. Otherwise, what's the point? We don't want to be a data collection system. We want to be something that's driving meaningful change within organisations. And for us, that change is safety. Yeah, and I suppose if you think about it in terms of um, acquired harms in a hospital, for example, generally speaking, in the same size of queue, acquired harms are all the same, but the severity of them might be different, the macro environment might be different, different factors that are involved, and they're the things we need to be teasing out, not just, yeah, you've had these acquired harms that are kind of things that do happen and we don't want to happen, but what are the other external factors impacting that? Yeah, and, and again, the data is normalised. So you go in to organisations and they will have this run rate that they've always reported on. So they go, oh, you know that we've always had this amount of falls or like you say, this amount of required harm. And it becomes normal. But actually, the normal should be, you know, a norm. <laughs> that should be. Yeah. And, and, and so we need to kind of get better at kind of saying, well, actually, how do we help you get there? Rather than it just being, here's our monthly board report where, look, yeah, Nothing's really changed. Everything's the same. Okay, let's see you again next month. It's like, well, no, look, here's what here's what Radar's saying we should be doing in terms of an action or where we should be spending our time. It's like, it's almost like we need that kind of maturity map of radar usage for our um, partners, if you think about it. from Actually, often we see people will measure on the volume of incidents being reported, and it's seen as a very good thing that the more you get more incidents reported, generally speaking, in radar systems. Um, so that's step one but that is just data collection we almost need to take people on that journey of well these volume of incidents now we want to see a decline and um, that map of how you can ultimately get to that zero harm culture yeah and again you know our our support in terms of the people in the organization as well it's not just a radar as a you know when i say products i mean the whole thing but like the technical product of you know just logging and all that kind of good stuff but the people who are supporting the customers need to be able to, uh, not necessarily challenge because that's not the right word, but need to have those conversations with the customer on, look, hey, where's what the system's telling you? And here's what we think's going on in, in your system. Here are the some weaknesses you might have in terms of how you're managing things, some complexities you might have introduced, which are now stopping you from being successful because you've introduced a whole lot of complexity that actually now makes it difficult for you to understand what's going on from a data point of view or an outcome point of view. So yeah, it, we, we need to be doing that collectively. It needs to be how we think as a, as an organisation as well. Yeah, and I wonder, that's a really interesting point because it mirrors what we see in the market quite often. You know, in the UK, really, we become very heavily focused on data collection and it almost becomes this reassurance that I collected all the information about this incident and I captured everything and it's a really thorough report and all the details there and kind of, that's great. But actually... um, It probably boils down to two or three key things that you need and we probably need less data but to be spend more time doing something with it because you know you can point to where the issues are from two or three data sets yeah i mean less about the complexity of getting the data i think one of the things that we see internationally is and and again it's quite difficult with some of the other national things that are going on but they remove the report from the from the from the idea of capturing data they just say well actually we've got all this in the EPR we've got this stuff in the patient record because they've got to track it all there so we'll just bring that into the system and you don't have to worry about well how many events are people creating because they're always created you know and you, you end up seeing kind of a you know a, a, a larger flow of data coming through and then from their point of view it's around just analyzing that data to again make more of an impact and make a difference and, and the way of doing the investigation is around actually what are we going to do to mitigate these things going forwards whereas as you see i think we've historically got into the habit as a national system of it's about tick boxes for the data and it's about producing these reports that people are interested in rather than kind of going well actually how does this data or information have any meaningful impact on improving patient safety yeah, and that's why the near miss is so important. That's almost more important. Hundred percent. You, you might be reporting on you know high harm events, but they've happened. I can't, I can't do anything about those. I can't stop those from happening. What I can do is get in front of the information that's telling me actually we're seeing an increase in these particular event types, and so far they might not have caused severe harm, but actually the tomorrow's incident and the actually you know it, it's going to be the one where it's going to impact on somebody's life. 
This next question is about user experience. And I think that kind of fits into what we're talking about because all of this, the input, the collection methods, the outputs, the way of being able to interrogate this data to, like your last point, um, change an impact on someone's life. How how easy is it in these dashboards specifically, but within Radar to kind of manage that user experience? I think we kind of pride ourselves on our UI UX at the moment, but like anything, we can obviously do more on that. So again, if we're kind of talking the vision for us, the vision from a reporter's point of view is actually you're not necessarily part of the puzzle anymore. Maybe we just want to kind of get the narrative from you in terms of almost like what you you say happened rather than you filling in lots of tick boxes and all that kind of stuff. We can interpret that or the system can do it because it comes from the EPR again. So from an input point of view, we almost want to make sure that that is just capturing information from all, all over the place. So again, wearables, internet things, devices, your other systems, wherever that stuff comes from, almost like you know, there's a big funnel and all that information is just getting poured into radar. So from a UX point of view, we're not necessarily having to burden anyone to put that into a system. It's just getting done, all, or done automatically. And then from an output point of view, kind of think think of us as the brain. So you're pouring all this, you're funneling this information into the brain. The brain's then kind of going, well, hold on a minute, I can see something's changed here, something's different. And then that's allowing you to get something that's surfaced directly to you, possibly not even through the analytics. Because again, you've got to log on and look at a dashboard. Why would we want to do that? We want to just say, hey, here's something that you need to worry about. So again, you know, this thing sits in the middle, it's doing all the worrying for you, taking all the inputs and then feeding you an output, which is, hey, this is the thing that we think you need to, to worry about. Here's what the risk looks like. So reducing the time to act, m- making sure that you're, you know, clearly aware of what we think the risk is again rather than kind of death by a thousand dashboards as, as lovely as dashboards you got to go look at them and you've got to interpret them and you've got to be somebody who knows how to read a dashboard and you've got to you know you've got to have some level of understanding to kind of get some meaning from that whereas actually the meaning is in the data in the background and the meaning just needs to be pulled out without you necessarily having to think about it yeah in a way so, that's consumable yeah yeah i you know, like that I, uh right Right, as the brain of safety, quality, and risk. Yeah, and 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 that that bit around at the moment, that brain is typically a person. So in our, in an organisation, you've got I'm, I'm going to, you know, a risk manager. You've got some a quality manager, somebody who's kind of responsible for all of this stuff. And the way technology is moving, in the nicest sense, you can't keep all of that in your head. You know, you've got all of these different systems. You've you've got all of these different pieces of technology that are now actually bringing in more risk because it's something that you're not necessarily in control of anymore. Whereas usually you were, you know, everything was getting reported, it got reported into a system, you saw what was going on, you knew what was happening, it was all sort of a manual process. You probably had your Excel spreadsheets and stuff that was sitting there capturing the information you needed to know. But now it's everywhere. Now this data is all over the place. And, and actually, you need to be able to take a step back from that part of it and stop worrying about the data bit, the capture bit, and worry about actually the layer above that. I'm actually, well, how am I going to make a difference using this information or not? And that, that that's definitely where we see ourselves. We don't want to be. We don't want to be like some of the other systems which have been around for twenty years and and you know have materially had no impact. We want to be the opposite. We want to we want to drive impact. We want to drive change. Yeah, and um, I mean, it's funny, there's the kind of three key components of Radar in terms of there's the data capture form, there's the workflow engine that can map business process, and then there's the outputs and the insights. And almost as an organisation, we've gone on that journey from starting as a data input form to then becoming kind of the jewel in our crown was always the workflow engine and the fact that you could manage your workflows to actually completely pivoting. And now we're about the insights, all of that drives. And so it's a real shift but shows, I suppose, an agility towards what's required and um, what's needed yeah, in the market. It's early days on some of this stuff as well, like some of the technology out there. You know, you go back, what, three, four years and talking about Gen AI and things like that, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a thing. You know, I, I, and now actually it's a thing that everybody uses every day pretty much. I know I do. Um, I know you do. Um, and ha- those sorts of technologies, you need to be able to weave them into what you're doing and you need to have a way of evolving as the, not not just the market from a risk point of view, but the kind of the technology markets and, and the, the tools you can use to help you. We need to be able to plug these things in so you know, give, give people access to the data in a, in, a, in a different way. You know, again, vision, you just 
you know, the red our brain, it's got the AI sat over the top of it. And, uh, and as I say, you just ask it a question and it'll come back with, you know, here's what I think you should be doing or here's what I think the risk looks like. Or today we think your risk is in this particular area because, you know, some other piece of information is telling us you've got low staff members in a certain area or staff well-being is not what it should be. So it's like, a, um, you know, if you search Google now and the AI, you get an AI, AI response, first of all, rather than a top search. It's that actually I've scraped everything and this is the summary of everything I found in all of the internet around that subject you've just asked me. That's almost where we're getting to, isn't it? Yeah. And then if you think now I'll construct that around a framework, so give it its parameters for a better way of describing it. So, you know, you've got a, a, a an AI bot that's helping you with everything that's got to do with surf or well led if you're in the in the England or, you know, if you're international customer, you know, joint commission style framework. You know, we can train these train these um algorithms up and these um AIs to be able to, you know, do whatever we want. You know, we're using them at the moment to start to think about helping people get up to speed with things like our APIs and our infrastructure. You know, you don't ask anybody in support question anymore. You ask our AI and it tells you now we're quite a piece of sequel. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so stuff. exciting, isn't it? And, and the speed at which it changes and the markets change, yeah. Because we got to be at that speed. And sometimes it's bumpy because it's all new stuff and, you know, we don't get there as you know fast as we would like. You know, I'd love to switch all this stuff on tomorrow. But, yeah, we, we need to keep keep a face with this. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So, I mean, the next question here is about, as we're looking to the future, the planned enhancements for the dashboards or new dashboards that are in development. But I think kind of summarising what you're saying is that, you know, it's not actually even about dashboards anymore. They're almost kind of passe and been and gone. It's about exposing the insights. And so what plans have Red Out got for that? I mean, I think I've sort of answered it in the, in my, in, in the, in the last five minutes. But, yeah, I think it's not that it's not about dashboards because they'll still be there. There'll still be a way of people being able to, you know, have reports and to be able to analyze the data because people use dashboards, you know, your weekly reports, your monthly reports, all that kind of good stuff. You'd still, still fill those out. But yeah, I think, again, just to reiterate, it's about us surfacing meaningful insight from that data, which might not have been in some of the dashboards that we are, the customers have created themselves. So we kind of need to go along. Hey, you might not be looking at this stuff, so we'll just look at it for you. Yeah, yeah, and the things that are not seen, the unknowns, exposed Exactly, them. like going back to your example of the review of, I see the data was there, but nobody was looking at it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it's all super exciting, isn't it? And the, I think it's interesting the point you make about the speed at which these things change and how we make sure that we keep all of our engines within radar, but within how we work with our partners and push that piece to make sure that we're keeping up to speed with these changes. And also... Um, discrediting them and this is a kind of final question for me is there been a technology that you thought would really really stick and take that hasn't or hasn't. A kind of, yeah it's something that you know we've looked at and thought oh that's going to be the way it's going to go and it's suddenly it's it's swerved from that i think the one that probably really surprises me about how slow adoption is are basically all of the different iot style sensors that are out there so there's quite a lot of different providers but you know if you think of care homes and some of the automated fall sensors there, think about hospitals and bed sensors and wearables. There's a ton of unbelievable technology out there and the speed at which the UK is adopting that is really slow. You know, I, I would argue there's a few other countries that are kind of, you know, leap years ahead of us in terms of like, um, you know, light years ahead of us in terms of what, where they are from a technology point of view. I think that's the one where I'm surprised at how slow that is. I know there's a cost associated with it, but the flip side of it of, well, actually, again, you don't necessarily need human beings doing this stuff anymore, even if it's just, you know, straightforward things like doing checks of temperatures and things like that. You know, there's a hundred things that can do that out there for you. And again, talking about trying to get people out of care homes, not in hospital, the home technologies, the wearables there can be measuring this and monitoring this stuff for you. I think we don't necessarily have a system that's being designed for the technologies that are out there and that are going to be out there. We seem to be trying to fix the now problem and you kind of go, well, actually, if we try and fix that now problem, by the time we fix that, the world's moved on so far that actually you don't, that, that isn't the problem you try to fix. If that makes sense. Yeah, almost like we, we, you can't put the stuff in the, you know, the nationally and the things that people kind of get upset about and it's all about 
throw in bodies at a problem for one of a better way of describing it when actually the technology solutions out there I mean you don't even have to go down that particular route but there doesn't seem to be that collective vision to do that so i think that's that's probably the big one for me if there's a ton of stuff out there that could be making a huge difference in healthcare and the adoption rate seems to be very slow yeah and i wonder if it boils down to the implementation because going kind of full circle in this conversation um there's always a need for things to have a localized nuance and it's how you manage those two tensions from having something that you can roll out on mass and have a kind of national implementation of something but then manage the localized nuances and that's something that i think in this country we've got to work massively on but um yeah, it's maybe something that we can start to think just within our kind of control of how we do that better and get make these things easier for people to adopt. Yeah. I think for us, we standardise how people connect into us. So again, you know, we, we you know this because I say it all the time, we're kind of partners and people we might integrate with, but we, we're ag- as agnostic as, as possible. You know, we want to be able to just be integrated with absolutely everything. And it's that type of thing I'm not... I'm, I'm not going to use the word interoperability, but it, it, it is around standards. And actually, you know, th- then it doesn't really matter as what, what sort of devices and things you're picking in. You give that local choice as long as it can connect to you in a meaningful way and give you the data that, data that you need. But again, just, yeah, reiterating that, I think that that, that up, uptake of those sorts of technologies is, is slow. Yeah. Well, maybe next time we speak, we'll start to have a, we'll start to see these things fledgling and uh, moving forward. So, coming to the end of the kind of um, session, I have to ask you about your health tech moment. So, um, at the end of each episode, we ask everyone to describe their what the health tech moment. And this is a question for a bit of fun, but we want to hear your weird and wonderful stories about what you've experienced in the health and social care industry. So, you kind of one moment. Last time I did this. Um, I don't know if you uh, watched the episode. It was Helen Baxendale from Exemplicare, and she had a real health tech moment that like knocked me off my seat. So I'm ready. So I, I, don't, I don't have any. I'm sorry. I'm like really boring because I've been on these about twenty times already. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't have any new ones. I'm afraid. Uh, well, I'll, I'll ask a new question, which will just throw everyone off course because I know I'm breaking the rules of the podcast. But um, what's the the coolest thing you've seen that one of our customers do with the radar product because we can only take it so far and i know you have really good vision and really good ideas but um we can drive that so far it's the customers that really bring other partners that really bring it to life what's the coolest thing you've ever seen out there so i'm going to change that question again and kind of go not necessarily the radar stuff, but the, the coolest bit of kit that i've seen was in the us a uh, us in a us hospital um, and basically, it was um, like a brain surgeon, and we were doing a kind of a tour of the hospitals, and we we walk, kind of walk into this room, and this surgeon comes in. And he's kind of look, he, he, he looked like Tom Cruise at a Top Gun to begin with. He was like super cool, well dressed, shared, so, so, and everyone's like, oh, it's Doctor Blah Blah Blah, and everyone's like thinks he's amazing. And he's like he's, he comes in, and everyone's like, oh, yes, Doctor Blah Blah, and he says, right, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to give you all a headset. You're going to put a headset on and then I'm going to perform the operation that I'm going to perform on you in two hours time for argument's sake. And so we all put on this like a, like a little mini auditorium for about 20 people. And the reason for it is it's for like the patient and their family. And so we all put this VR headset on and he proceeds to kind of go, look, here's what I'm going to be doing. This is what I'll be doing to a, to a potential patient. And, and in VR, he walks through doing the exact same procedure that he was about to do when he was going to physically operate in kind of two or three three hours time. And he kind of does it and you watch, you think, oh my God, this is amazing. He's like, here's me kind of, you know, going into the brain, taking out this tumor, blah, blah, blah. And then he comes out of it and he goes, right, okay, I've finished. And then we all take the headsets off and he kind of goes, now what you've seen that, I basically, this is about consent. You know, do you consent for me to do the operation in kind of, you know, tomorrow, today, whenever it was. And everyone's just, oh my God, yeah, that was amazing. And, And he just, as impatient, it would have just given you so much reassurance that this guy was just unbelievable. And he's literally just doing the exact same operation that he's going to do with you in virtual reality to give you complete confidence that actually when you go into the operating theater in you know, the next day or whenever it was, that you're going to be in safe hands. And I just can remember taking the headset off and thinking, I mean, I know the US healthcare model is very different, but just imagine that for patients that just, you know, we're going to give you some confidence that we know what we're doing and just give you that assurance 
so that you want, one, you can consent to exactly what the operation is. But just to give you that kind of peace of mind, it was amazing. Honestly, it was really super cool. And he was, yeah, it was like Tom, Gru- Tom Cruise at Top Gun. He was very cool. <laughs> Well, maybe that is the future, yeah. Or maybe it was just because it was like Tom Cruise and it was like, yeah, that's super cool. Brilliant. Thank you for joining us this week, Mark. And thanks to everyone for listening. Join us next week for another new episode. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. And if you've got any questions for us or for Mark or any of our guests, please email whatthehealthtech at radarhealthcare.com. Hold up. 